Hi, uh, welcome everyone. We're so happy that you could join us this evening. This is our Waters to the Sea Stories webinar. The title this evening is Visualizing the Mississippi River, and we're gonna focus on geographic literacy, cultural landscapes, and environmental stewardship. So this evening we are hosting as Hamlin University Center for Global Environmental Education. And we are very excited to have our guest speaker here tonight from ESRI, the global market leader in geographic information system software and mapping. So a few housekeeping things to remind you of in our webinar before we get started. Uh, you should have access to the chat feature. So we'll be sharing some resources and links in the chat as the webinar goes on this evening. We'll have some question and answer time at the end of the session. So if something comes to mind and you'd like to enter it in the chat anytime throughout the webinar, please feel free to do that. And we will try to address that at the end of our presentation. This webinar will be recorded and Sarah, one of our co-hosts over here, will send you the link in about two weeks, along with links to the entire presentation, a lot of great resources, a lot of other professional development opportunities and so on. So you can look forward to that. So as uh, part of Hamlin, we like to read our land acknowledgement before each program presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and take a minute to do that. You can just sit back, relax, read along, or just listen. So Hamlin University acknowledges that the land on which we gather and refer to as Minnesota is the traditional and unceded territory of the Dakota and Ojibwe. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for the region Minnesota, Makoska, the land where the waters reflect the skies. We pay respect to the citizens of these tribes, but others as well, both past and present, and their continuing relationship to their ancestral lands. Making this recognition expresses gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and honors the indigenous people who have been existing with and on the land from time immemorial. This long-standing history is significant as land acknowledgements do not exist in past tense or historical context. Colonialism, appropriation, and genocide have relevant real-time realities. Build mindfulness regarding the source of our present land privilege, understand the long-standing history from which it comes, and seek to reconcile our place within both. Hamlin as an institution and community will hold itself accountable as an indigenous partner by working stridently to amplify, address and counter the historical and contemporary injustices that continue to impact indigenous people individually and structurally. So a big welcome from our team. Here we are, we're Hamlin Center for Global Environmental Education. We are led by our fearless leader, Tracy Fredeen, who is in the audience this evening. We are uh, hosted right here by Sarah Robertson, and I'm sure you've seen her name on all of the outcoming uh, mail and updates on professional development opportunities, webinars, news, and so on. Her official title is super long and I can't wait to read it to you. <laughs> she is the Teacher Professional Development and Community Outreach Program Administrator. So anything you need to know, she probably knows it. Um, my name is Chris Bennett and I'm the Director of K-12 through Resources. I'll be putting links in the chat throughout the webinar for uh, resources you may like to use if you are a teacher in our audience or if you have family, friends, or people in your community who are teachers that would like access to those as well. All right, the highlight of our show, we have two presenters this evening. We're very lucky to have Charlie Fitzpatrick here. So he's currently the K-12 Education Manager at ESRI. He was previously a grade seven through 12 teacher at the St. Paul Academy in St. Paul. So we're very fortunate to have him with us this evening. And John Shepard, who is our Assistant Director at 
CG. So CG, if you haven't figured it out yet, stands for the Center for Global Environmental Education. And John does wear many hats there. So he's also our a director of multimedia production. And he was the creator of our Waters to the Sea online programs, which uh, we have many and you'll see some of them tonight. Ooh, that's it. <laughs> Coming back to that later. So right now I'm going to turn this over to John and Charlie. So please enjoy. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, hopefully, uh, people are seeing a story map collection. This is an Esri tool that um, allows us to assemble some contents. And there was a wonderful uh, introduction to the uh, event and a request for people to fill out a survey. And as we begin, you might have the chance to fill out this survey if you didn't already take this chance. And uh, you can do this at any time during this survey, but uh, you can aim your phone, your camera phone, the camera on your phone at the QR code. That's maybe the easiest way to do this. Or you can type out the URL that you see, arcg.is slash Miss Riv May 23. And with that, I get to say thank you to Hamlin, to CG, to my wonderful friends uh, uh, out there in virtual land. Thank you for letting me uh, participate in this with you. Great. Well, thanks, Charlie. Um, I, I'm going to say a few words, too, by way of in introduction. Um, this is really fun. Uh, Charlie and I went to high school together and uh, have remained in touch uh, over the years as we have um, at uh, the Center for Global Environmental Education uh, developed our learning programs, our um, online teacher institutes and so forth. You know, it's been really valuable to be able to access some of the geographic information system resources that ESRI has provided. And Charlie's been very generous in um, supporting us over the years uh, with uh, software resources and uh, training activities. And we were particularly excited when ESRI developed um, this technology that they call Story Maps. And um, the the uh, landing page that uh, that Charlie started showing there, which we will be returning to, is an example. This is what you're looking at right now is an example of a story map. Um, and what I, what I think is really exciting about them is it it's uh, this blending of the the kind of visualizations that you can get with maps, which are such a powerful way of thinking about places, um, understanding our relationship to landscapes. But uh, they also integrate stories. And I think that's those are themes that are going to be running through this presentation tonight. And I just kind of throw out as a question uh, for folks to think about, uh, how do we understand a place? You know, whether it's um, the place where you live, a place that you love to visit, um, a place, uh, a, a natural landscape. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Mississippi River tonight. So, you know, how can we understand um, a place? How can we make sense of the Mississippi River? Um, and I would suggest, you know, we're as human beings, we are highly visual creatures. So we're looking at this whole idea of visualizing the Mississippi. What uh, what pictures of uh, a resource like the Mississippi River, can we develop in our minds to help us interpret and make sense of the world around us? And I think uh, the combination of storytelling and uh, maps, uh, visual uh, representations of landscapes is a very, very powerful uh, combination. So that's what we're going to be exploring tonight, you know, that that kind of intersection uh, as a way of illuminating uh, places that we might want to teach about if we're teaching children, uh, bringing to life uh, places of importance and understanding the, the multi-dimensions of those places. 
So um, those are just a few words of introduction. And uh, we're going to return to this survey. Uh, those of you who have completed it, you know, we're asking for your uh, for those of you that haven't, there are just a few questions about kind of your relationship with the Mississippi River. And Charlie's going to share a way that um, a survey like that can be used in a presentation uh, down the road. So, Charlie, you want to jump ahead to the sure. next let's, piece here? Let's, let's roll. You're on a roll. And okay. uh, I'm going to say, okay. Uh, do you want to let me give you control? Yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that? So, All right, you're in charge. All right, let's see if I can do this. All right, so so I'm going to start off with just uh, a few introductory thoughts about uh, the Mississippi River, ways of thinking about the river. And I love this quote by Henry David Thoreau. It's one that I return to often in our educational work uh, around rivers. I was, and this is an excerpt from one of his poems. I was born upon, I was born upon thy bank river. My blood flows in thy stream and thou meanderest forever at the bottom of my dream. And it's really a conviction of mind that, um, that rivers and watersheds uh, are no longer alive to us in the way that they would have been, they would have been more alive to us in the days when Henry David Thoreau was living. Um, uh, in the days before highways, before railroads, before airplanes, uh, in the early days of, um, uh, in pre-industrial days of our, of our continent, um, rivers, you know, were ways of thinking about and understanding uh, the landscapes around us, rivers and watersheds. So that I think is a, it's a fertile idea. And I'm going to um, kind of explore that a little bit more. So this, this image uh, that you're seeing right now is a map uh, that was developed by Joseph Nicolay. And he did so um, in the course of several expeditions throughout the region that is now Minnesota um, in the 1830s, 18, uh, I think it was 1836, 37, 38, right in there. And uh, he was a map maker and look what he mapped. I mean, this was, he, he, he um, you know, this was some of the earliest uh, detailed mapping uh, act activities of this region. And what did he map? He mapped the rivers and watersheds. And how was he traveling? He was traveling, uh, primarily on rivers and uh, and also on foot, but, you know, traveling by canoe up the Mississippi River uh, through our region and uh, its tributaries, you know, what he was paying attention to is uh, how these rivers flow together. And you would be very much aware in those, in that, um, in that time, if you were traveling across the landscape, what, when you, when you go up uh, a river and it's, and if you go up a tributary as far as you can go and you get to its headwaters, um, you're going to know when you cross over the height of land that leads to the next watershed, because you're going to pick up your canoe and carry it uh, over that, over that height of land. And so this idea of a watershed, it's, as I've thought about this, it's just clear to me that you would have known uh, what these watershed boundaries were and those and just to restate or to state a watershed is an area that drains into a river so when you go up the tributaries of uh, of a river and get to the headwaters you get a the cross over an area of land before you'll get to the next river so you would have had this inherent awareness of the landscape that would have been the way you would have oriented yourself and if we look at this map, um, I've overlaid a little bit of graphics here so you can see the, what we now recognize as the Minnesota River uh, flowing from the northwest um, into the Mississippi and the circle area where the uh, Twin Cities were eventually going to be uh, developed. And you can see the Mississippi River flowing off to the, to the southeast there. Um, and so let's jump ahead in time to that same orientation today. So this is a this is a map from Google. This is a Google map of the same area. And what do we see? Well, you can still see the Mississippi River because it's wide enough that it actually shows up on the map. The Minnesota River has virtually disappeared because it isn't as prominent uh, of a waterway. But what do you see? You see highways uh, that are numbered and named. We see the outline of the metropolitan area. So my contention is after 
you know, years of working in this realm, uh, you know, we carry around maps in our minds of the world around us. But the map that we tend to carry, uh, we being, you know, those of us living in this day and age, you know, is one that looks a lot more like this. We think of where we are by the highways uh, surrounding us, the roadways, the cities, the county boundaries, sometimes the state boundaries and so forth, which is just such a contrast to the world that Joseph Nicolay uh, was was seeing. So that's one way I think of uh, rivers as, um, um, you know, the going back to the Henry David Thoreau quote, you know, one of the ways that rivers are at the bottom of our dreams, they're sort of underneath our awareness, but they're there. And I think we've lost something um, in the time that have passed, you know, we've gained many other ways of understanding the world, not, you know, not that that's bad, but there's something valuable to be regained by uh, being able to reclaim some of that um, uh, understanding of the landscapes that would have been earlier, more, more um, natural for us at an earlier time. This is another uh, graphical representation of a landscape. And these are just incredible uh, series of maps. Um, it is um, a map of a portion of the Mississippi River. It was made in the 1940s uh, by a um, map maker and geologist uh, who worked with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And what you're looking at, um, the the you can see the main course of the Mississippi running uh, top of this, you know, north or top of the map uh, through the center, and then it winds around and, uh, you know, does a big curly cue and then exits out the bottom. That is when the map was made, that was the current main course of the river. All of the other colored bands that you see are historical pathways that the Mississippi River has followed in times past. And I, this just blows my mind how. Uh, one could accurately um, uh, come up with this kind of visualization is just mind boggling. Um, and what, you know, what did it take to do that? Obviously, uh, close study of soils, um, you know, would have been a strong part of that. There's a, you know, a strong geologic dimension to this. So I've got a, and I should emphasize again, everything we're sharing with you tonight, including this, the story map that is organizing all this content is available to you. Uh, this is a, you can see the, the, uh, there's a link at the bottom of the map there. So this, that will lead to, um, uh, that you can download this entire series in high uh, resolution. They make <laughs> beautiful frameable prints if you're so inclined. Um, anyway, just want to emphasize that all of this stuff we're sharing is uh, available to you, but, um, this, again, is a, another way of thinking about the depth of, you know, another way that the Mississippi River is at the bottom of our dreams. You know, there's we can't see uh, if you were to just travel over this landscape in a car or um, you you wouldn't have an awareness of all of the depth of the historical meanderings of the river that's beneath it there. So here's another take uh, kind of around some of these same issues. This is a just a close up map again off of. Uh, Google Maps of a section of the Mississippi River. And of course, the Mississippi, one of the things it does is it, it um, uh, as it flows uh, from northern Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico, it, in many places, except for Louisiana and Minnesota, uh, the in-between uh, states, it forms a, a state boundary. Uh, um, you know, so you have, in this case, Arkansas on one side and Tennessee on the other. Um, and, you know, so kind of makes sense. Big waterway, you know, is a, is a way of forming a boundary between areas of land that have been become recognized as um, having some internal integrity, in this case, states of the United States. Um, also looking at the map above the word Arkansas, you can see kind of these 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 curl these curving uh, areas of water, three of them that are kind of very similarly shaped. Um, and that kind of gives you a clue as to what you see when you actually overlay uh, this image. And this, the, the line that now flows through this image, is actually the state boundary, the way it is now. So if you were to, I got this off of a highway map and trace that. So um, what's interesting about it is, you know, the, here you have uh, to, to the left of the word Arkansas, you have this large area of land that is on the west side of the Mississippi River, 
that is part of Tennessee. And above the, the, the word Tennessee, you have a chunk of land that's part of Arkansas that is on the east side of the Mississippi River. So, you know, how did that happen? Well, the river is constantly changing. And so as it flows, especially in the lower Mississippi, it meanders incredibly and it's constantly changing its route, uh, tends to form these large oxbow lakes and those three curving uh, areas of water above the word Arkansas. Those are former channels of the river are, uh, and remnants uh, channels uh, now called Oxbow Lakes. And so when um, the uh, state boundaries were drawn, the, the the actual course of the river would have followed this orange line that runs uh, runs through the map. But since then, the river has changed course. And so that's how you get, if you uh, explore uh, a highway map close up, you'll see that, which is just another example of, um, you know, the river. We, we like to set things, humans have a way of wanting to set things in, in stone kind of, and we like to, you know, like uh, lay our uh, understandings on the landscape, but then something as dynamic as the Mississippi River isn't quite so easily contained. Uh, moving on to another idea, just two, this is two different ways of thinking about the Mississippi River. One is thinking of it as a ribbon of water that flows from point A to point B. And, uh, you, you know, that is the Mississippi River corridor, the blue, dark blue line that runs um, through and touches 10 states uh, in its 2300 mile journey. And what, uh, you know, what does that give you as a way of thinking about the river? So the, the bullet points list some things that come with that way of thinking about and understanding the river. So it forms the border of 10 states. It's 2,350 miles long. It also is a world-class migratory flyway. So the, the river itself, its main corridor and the incredibly um, biologically rich wetlands that it supports uh, enables, you know, it enables it to serve as a flyway for migratory waterfowl. Uh, and that is a function of the river as a ribbon of water. It's also a commercial highway and has been as long as people have been around here. Uh, and it's a source of drinking water for some 50 cities and more than 18 million people. So those are all kind of ways of uh, um, facts associated with the river that come from this perspective. But here's a different perspective. This is thinking about the Mississippi as a watershed. And that, that opens up other kinds of uh, ways of thinking and, and ideas. So uh, from this perspective, the Mississippi, you know, much, much larger than a ribbon of water. You know, it's draining 40 percent of the continental U.S., all are parts of 32 states and two Canadian provinces. It's the world's fourth largest watershed. So it's huge. You know, the river itself as a ribbon of water is a major river, but uh considered as a watershed. It's truly, truly dramatic. Uh, not only that, there's some other implications of thinking about the river in this way. Uh, this orientation explains the fact that there is what is called the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. The dead zone is an area of the Gulf, and it runs from the mouth of the Mississippi River, generally goes more to the west uh, along the Gulf Coast there, and uh, it is an area of, of, uh, of the Gulf of Mexico that is depleted of oxygen. Uh, it's depleted of oxygen because of the nutrient load, the, the um, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, mostly that comes from agricultural uh, far, farms in the upper Midwest that um, those nutrients uh, flow down the river, enter the Gulf of Mexico, and um, they, uh, the result is this depleted oxygen uh, area. And so you wouldn't have that uh, phenomena without the functioning of a land of a watershed because those farms are spread out over multiple states and they flow through multiple, the, the nutrients are flowing through multiple um, tributaries of smaller rivers that uh, drainage ditches and small rivers that ultimately empty in the Mississippi. So that is a function of the Mississippi as a watershed. Um, the other thing is uh, thinking about a river as a watershed really highlights the relationship between land use and water quality. And that dead zone is an example of that. Um, so the fact is 
uh, those of us living in urban areas, um, you know, you can you can in the Twin Cities area where we are, where I am, uh, you can be miles from the Mississippi River. But the the things that I do in my backyard, how I manage um, my grass clippings, uh, what I do with the re the leaves that I rake up in the in the autumn, whether they go down the storm sewer or not, or whether I clean them up. Uh, those choices I make will have an impact on the river, even though I live miles from the river, because of the fact that all these lands within the watershed uh, flow, the drain into the river. And in urban areas, of course, we have storm sewer systems that uh, accentuate that direct connection uh, between wherever you might happen to live and uh, the river. So that's the end of my piece. Charlie, I'm going to you can reclaim and move on to the next part of our. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is this, if I go forward, is this? Um, let's see. How do I? Well, let's see if I stop. Okay, hit, there we go. Maybe if you hit escape, you'll stop sh uh, sharing the slideshow. Ah, perfect. Excellent. All right. There we go. Now, well, I, actually, this is me. Yeah. yeah, sorry. So, yeah, um, if you can let me go ahead, yep. I'm going to briefly uh, want to just introduce this resource. Um, this is our Waters to the Sea Mississippi River Adventure. This is all. This is a story map. This is an um, S3 story map, and this is kind of our um, uh, flagship learning uh, resource that our center has created. Um, and it is um, uh, provides a rich, probably six to seven hours worth of content um, that you can see is organized according to these tabs across the top of the screen. Um, so this is an introductory screen. Um, and basically what we're exploring in this as uh, we're exploring the river as a, as a ribbon of water, as a watershed, and looking at the ways that humans have lived uh, with with the Mississippi River uh, through time and what the what the what kind of relationship we have with this uh, incredible natural resource. So there's a uh, introductory video here. We introduce topics of what is the water cycle, what is a watershed. We have a built-in water quality lab that you can a virtual water quality lab you can explore. We get the introductory uh, content on ecosystems, and then uh, clicking these other links. Um, there we begin to get into the uh, the rich map resources that uh, come with a story map like this. So this is our version of um, a similar image of the the ribbon of water, and every one of the green dots is then a place based story of you know different kinds of media that you can explore. So that's one way of of interacting with this as through the map interface. And as I zoom in, eventually. I will begin to see uh, additional layers of information. So now here are all the tributaries and so forth. Uh, but you can also then access content by media type. So uh, we have numerous uh, interactive modules, uh, interactive 360 panoramas, lots and lots of videos uh, that can be found there. And then you can also then sort through all this content through different lenses. Like I just wanna see all the social science related content or engineering or life science. So those are tabs across the top as well. Um, and then there are additional, additional content here, uh, educator resources. We have all of this content linked with um, uh, next generation science standards and so forth. So this, we just wanna make you aware of this as a learning resource that's available to you. It's free of charge um, and please use it up. <laughs> so. I will stop there, Charlie. Now it is truly back to you. Terrific. Thank you, John. And uh, okay, so this is the chance for you, your last chance to participate in this audience survey. It's a great thing to do. And really the whole idea about this is we wanted to gather some impressions from you, trying not to be invasive, but to be interested in your experiences. And so you've got really three ways to participate in this if you haven't yet. One, you can uh, scan this with your smartphone and launch this QR code. Uh, go ahead and say, yep, I wanna, I wanna go to that ArcGIS thing. 
Uh, second, you could type in that same address. And if you've already done this, that's great. Uh, no worries. And third, we're actually going to be sharing this link to this address or to this story map collection with you so that you can share this with others as well so that they can go through this and they could be looking at this and doing it even just on this on the story map itself because here i have embedded the survey that you took and so we asked you a little bit of you know just give us an identifier not your name uh and so uh people i started taking a look at some of the results and people have been uh, wonderfully creative here and then a, a a favorite ing word i believe that's called a gerund and uh that is uh, that that you attach to the mississippi and okay if you need to uh use multiple words that's great and then three words that come to mind relating to the mississippi then we wanted to look at the last 12 months of your life how close have you been at closest to the Mississippi during the last 12 months? And uh, so we picked uh, five distances and and uh, hope that you could uh, find yours within that. Then this was, I think, sort of the most exciting one was at what age did you have your first interaction with the Mississippi that you can remember? And you had to put in a whole number in here, rounding upwards, I, I suppose, for uh, those of you who are, you know, born on the edges of the summertime. And then my fave, mark the site of your most personally significant interaction with the Mississippi. And, and it's this part of doing a survey where you can tie that data to a spot on the land or on the water, someplace you can, you can attach this set of information to. And that allows you to do all different kinds of things. And if you weren't really sure how to narrow in, you could type in an address, type in a zip code and kind of move your way around. But the key is to just click on the map somewhere and uh, make the marker appear there and then to hit submit. So hopefully you got to do that and you hit submit and now, great, what happens from all of that? Well, we can turn that data into a map and automatically we've set it up so that the data that you generate is going up into the cloud and there's a bucket up there that is holding this data. And we just said, let's take a look at that data. And so here are the data points that you generated. And so this is a live interactive map and we can go zoom in and say, hey, there's somebody down here right at the mouth. There's a, there's a dude um, and there's somebody who was a hundred yards away, didn't wanna share much more than that. And going all the way up, all the way up and even outside. Well, gosh, look at all these people who've been here up near the headwaters. There are all interesting kinds of things. And so there are some explorations that you can do with these data, but working with it just in this map is, is actually a little bit hard because you, you have to go through this one, one little segment at a time, poking at one little item at a time. Sometimes it's better to do in a bulk process. And so we have a tool that will take that very same map, that very same data, and allow you to work some things through this. You have familiarity driving a car with the dashboard. Dashboard tells you all kinds of information about the car. It's about your car. It's about the car that you're driving. A variety of elements in that dashboard. We do the same thing with a map. And here we've got 45 dots on this map, but this is a little hard to see. So I'm going to just arrow it out into a big full scale uh, display here. And what we've got, I want to, let me see, I want to hide this, hide that. Oops, I want to show that. That's, let's see, get the navigation. That's what I wanted to do. All right, hide the table. And 
give me that word cloud, the identifier. Oh, I don't want the identifier for the word clouds. Yeah, all right. The word clouds are, are, are holding out on me here. Sometimes we can get them to appear and sometimes we have to just refresh it and make it show. But in the meantime, we can zoom out to see the whole world and see if anybody was here from beyond. Ooh, we've got somebody who, uh, this is actually at latitude longitude zero, zero. And so uh, if you didn't put in anything on the map, that's where it went. So we've got data that we can be taking a look at here. And we've got most people were actually under 100 yards. Uh, next most under a mile. Wow, this is a really nice, uh, nice, neat curve here. We had 45 responses. And what's interesting is that we can go through and explore these and say, hey, the average age, 25 and a half. And you can see along the bottom in this green chart that we've got a variety of responses. Lots of, wow. Hey, we just added one. Somebody enhanced it. So this is a live data set that you're seeing that is being added to on the fly. And so that's part of the magic of working with a GIS is to take advantage of the power of interactive uh, resources and to see the information that people are putting into it use the power of the map to explore these things, and then just go to town with whatever it is that you happen to have data about. All right, uh, I want now to jump ahead up to the next one. And this is, okay, we played with a bunch of, you know, interesting data that you guys put together. What about people who put together data for their business, for their operation, for their government job, to be able to collect data and distribute it to the people who want to use this. As we worked with NOAA to create a site called, we call it camera, but it's really climate mapping for resilience and adaptation. As the climate is changing, how do we cope with it? And so there's a lot of content here, and this is just built in right now to this uh, story map collection. And we're going to take a look at five pieces of information. And these are climate hazards in real time. So what you're seeing over here is the last 30 days. And these are wildfires and places of uh, drought, places uh, where things are dry, and places of prescribed fires and places of, okay, not enough rainfall, things like that. So here you're taking a look at fires and it's been kind of going down. And I'm delighted to see that there are not a whole bunch that are happening in out west, but gosh, look at these big fires that are happening up north. Well, maybe it's related to some of the drought conditions. Now here, the last one, the fires you were seeing 30 days, here you're seeing 52 weeks. And so you all probably remember that this was deep, deep red out on the West Coast and uh, not so much in the interior. Now it's starting to get to be in the interior. You can come in and take a look at this. And this is saying abnormally dry. All I did was just click on it. This is designed for you to explore this percentage of US in each drought category, you can see this. All right, so let's keep taking a look at this. Inland flooding. Now, uh, we have some family uh, that is here in the uh, upper Midwest. I do have some family there. And uh, so I've been watching this and it has, the floods have been moving away from the Twin Cities area and moving downstream. And that's what you're seeing here. These are zones of 24 hour precipitation, sorry, 72 hour precipitation in the background that you're seeing. And given all of the flooding that has happened farther north and the precipitation that is happening, where are the places that we're uh, watching out for right now? So inland flooding is gonna be a thing that people need to be careful about in the coming decades. Coastal flooding, Okay, come on, there we go. 
Coastal flooding was not working when I was checking it earlier today, and it looks like that service is having a hiccup. Uh, but you should be seeing uh, that there are some uh, storm warnings or some coastal flood watches and things like that. It may just be that there's nothing happening across the country, but usually there's something. So let's jump over to the extreme heat because we are having uh, zones of extreme heat. Now, why, why do we pay attention to this? Because the conditions are going to be different. What's going to be happening to the land? What's going to be happening to the water cycle? That cycle is really important for what happens to the rest of the people in the watershed. Now, this is a, a nice little sort of quick exploration of it, but the whole notion of this is to take a look at your community, to take a look at my community, where I live. I want to see this tool close up. And so there is an assessment tool that you can launch here. And this is going to launch in a separate tab. And it's going to say, give me a, 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 an address, a place. And I'm just going to put in 55105. I think that's a zip code somewhere in the St. Paul area. And so here, in fact, this, you're seeing Ramsey County in the St. <laughs> Paul area. And you can look at. Uh, data according to census tract, small little division, county or tribal land. And what you're seeing here are indicators for extreme heat modeled right now. Uh, this is uh, actually going back in time. And then here's the right now, the early part of the century. And so this is uh, 2015 to 2044, the mid-century, and then the late century. And what you're seeing is a couple of different models that pay attention to lower admission, lower emissions, and higher emissions. What's going to happen with the model if we have higher emissions versus lower? And what's going to happen in heat? And so here you get a set of a data attached here. So right now, we're 27.7 degrees in, in that, uh, that area, uh, Ramsey County, 27.7 days with the maximum temperature over 90 degrees, which is 16.4, it was 16 point, uh, that's a growth of 16.4 days since the span of 1976 to 2005. Here we are 18 years later than that. And so this is going up. And if that's if we stay on track in this zone of 2015 to 2044, keep growing the way we're growing, that's what we're gonna have here, are the higher emissions. And you can see some more uh, data going down, but let's take a look at the drought. Oh. Okay, so this is getting to be a more significant thing. And wildfire, wow, with more, with higher emissions, wow, this is quite a range. Because it's in the late century, it's hard to predict that far out, but we can make some judgments based on this. Flooding, and you can go through and you can see where things are in your area. We're not too doing too much with coastal inundation here in the Twin Cities, but you can go back also and take a look at this and say, hey, in this zone, Ramsey County, 28.2% of the population is in disadvantaged communities. So there's a very large group of people that are disadvantaged that have less capacity to cope with the changes that are coming environmentally. And how's our building code? Are we built for lower resistance or higher resistance uh, to the kinds of hazards that we'll be running into? Then you can go in and explore, hey, I just want to see, and now we're looking at the map and this, 
we're seeing, okay, we're still in Ramsey County. Let's get rid of Ramsey County. Let's use the tool and maybe go down to someplace down here. And now you're looking at this and we've got 83 and a half degrees uh, above 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the early century, 97 in the mid century, 110 in the late century. What are the kinds of changes that you're going to be encountering, both from extreme heat or coastal inundation? Wow. That's looking like, uh, yeah, you're going to be out on your uh, on your on your boat there, I guess, uh, whether you want to or not. So this is one of the things that we want people to take a look at at census tract level, at county level, tribal land. Take a look at the changes that are are coming at us, and that you can be thinking about. Okay, are we ready for these? So that's built in here. So let's go back to John. John, are you ready to rock and roll? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, okay, let me jump back. Yeah, oh. so I'm going to... Can you can you, okay? can you can you control it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Let's see if I can get this going. Uh, there we go. Okay, so um, moving forward here, I'm um, going to look at a couple of locations. Uh, hang on. Okay. Um, first is looking at a, a waterway in an urban area. And again, the idea here is, you know, how is this being, uh, how is this river changing? How is this waterway changing? And how um, how can we represent uh, its, its, how has its condition been represented historically? and today. So we're looking at a, a creek um, near downtown St. Paul. So downtown St. Paul is at the bottom of the screen. Phelan Creek uh, is a relatively small creek that um, historically flowed into the Mississippi River from uh, a series of lakes upstream, the chain of lakes um, and Phelan Lake. Um, and it has suffered the fate that many urban uh, waterways like this have suffered. Um, and the uh, the first part of the story really goes back to uh, pre-European um, settlement days uh, from the perspective of the, the Dakota, uh, who for, this is Dakota homelands we're looking at here. Um, and I'm going to start out with this map uh, that we were looking at earlier by Joseph Nicolay. And this is a, just a zoomed in version of the same area. And one of the interesting things I see here is that this was a time, again, 1839 or so, when you are seeing some um, uh, indigenous names of places. So um, the, the entire area is referred to as the Midewakanton country. So that's a reference to a, a Dakota name for this area. But at the same time, um, we have some English names starting to show up. So we have the St. Croix River flowing over here, an English name. And in the other area, just to the left there that's highlighted, uh, three of the lakes that are a very prominent park lakes in downtown or in the city of Minneapolis, Lake of the Isles, Lake Calhoun, and Lake Harriet have already been recognized uh, by uh, English names. Um, and here is Phelan Creek represented on this map. And you can see that there's a lake uh, that appears to be the source of this uh, creek. This it's called Bears Lake, which I believe is now known as White Bear Lake, uh, has a similar kind of a shape and is about that distance away. And you can see the creek flows directly from, uh, <clears throat> from Bear Lake or White Bear Lake into the Mississippi River. Well, what has happened over time is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, the fate of the creek is the, what has happened to so many urban uh, creeks in the Twin Cities and in other areas. Basically, it has disappeared from the landscape. So Lower Phelan Creek, so the section that we can, of the map here uh, begins just downstream of 
of Lake Phelan and the creek from where it exited uh, Lake Phelan was basically turned into a storm sewer. So that means to control flooding, um, you know, an underground pipe was was created that drained water from the lake directly to the to the Mississippi River. So this happened in the early 1900s. Um, and what are the implications of that happening? Uh, besides the fact that the creek itself disappears from, from the map. Well, there was an immigrant community that lived along the creek uh, in an area called Sweet Hollow that actually used the creek directly uh, for drinking water. You can see, and, and, for their, <clears throat> and for their wastewater as well, presumably. So there was you know, an, a, a poor community of, of houses and shacks there um, that basically was no longer able to sustain itself um, when when the creek was turned into a um, into a uh, storm sewer. So what's happening now? Uh, a Dakota-led organization, the Lower Phelan Creek Project, is actually bringing back the creek, um, and what they're doing is a process called daylighting. So what it means is actually recreating the waterway at the surface where it once flowed. Um, and allowing, and, and the initial project will uh, cover the, the first quarter mile of, of the creek. So, you know, there's this trans transformational process happening um, that is, is, uh, is, is bringing the, the creek back up to the surface. And um, <clears throat> the, the organization is Dakota-led. Uh, Keely uh, Sayaka is one of the staff members there who, um, in one of our videos that you can explore, on your own, she she get, provides some uh, orientation to what this means to their community, as far as it uh, having been an important historical resource uh, that now is becoming available to them once again. So, an interesting tale that I think you know shed some light on how our kind of our historic relationship uh, with urban waterways, and what we have done is taken that story and other stories uh, of places of importance uh, to the Dakota community. In a, we worked in a collaborative uh, project with the Lower Phelan Creek Project to create an interactive map. And again, the, there's a link. Charlie, I don't know if you can scroll a little bit. The bottom of the uh, uh, image isn't quite visible. There's a, a link there. Um, well, I'm sorry, we're jumping ahead. Um, so eh, maybe that maybe that can't happen. Um, anyway, so we created an interactive learning program exploring Dakota lands and waters where places like Phelan Creek that have that deep historical importance for the Dakota are represented on an interactive map. In this case, uh, each of the each of the red circles on the map is a hotspot. There's 15 different videos that interpret those locations. Most almost all of them were produced by uh, Dakota. Uh, video producers, we produced a couple of them collaboratively with them. We have the place names on the legend on the right. You can click on those and hear the correct pronunciation of all the names. And you can also explore the map itself. And this is a map created by a Dakota artist. And you can see uh, her name is Marlena Miles. And she has blended uh, place names, uh, Dakota place names for all these different places. And they're kind of coded as to what type of place they were. So some are burial mounds, some are village sites, others are different kinds of sacred locations. But you can see she's also blended in aspects of what are found today. So uh, in the Twin Cities, you have downtown Minneapolis, downtown St. Paul, you have the light rail system visible there, you have um, uh, other features of the modern landscape. So it's a it's an interesting way of um, kind of blending these different cultural perspectives in an interactive map experience. Um, so going to jump briefly to the Delta region and just talk a little bit about um, um, the challenges and ways of understanding what is a fascinating uh, part of the world. So the, the Mississippi River Delta is one of the major uh, river deltas in the world. It is uh, incredibly um, biologically rich uh, bird life, fish life, um, and a very important resource um, economically, 
for the United States, the ports um, of New Orleans and St. Bernard Parish, which is uh, St. Bernard Parish is just downstream of New Orleans. You can see the main channel of the Mississippi flowing down through the Delta there. Um, the, the combined ports of the area are the world's uh, largest ports by uh, volume in terms of the volume of goods and that travel through there. Um, and to understand, uh, and it's an area that is highly endangered. And one of the things that's happening is the disappearance of coastal wetlands. So much of what kind of looks like land in this image is actually um, in, increasingly open water. And that's due to a number of factors. And we're gonna just look at that briefly. This is a video, there's no audio that plays with this. And it is the basically the, the recent geologic history of the formation of uh, the Mississippi River Delta. And each of these squiggly lines is a different course that the Mississippi has taken over time. And you'll see uh, dates popping up occasionally to kind of give you an orientation. So what happens is, a lobe of the delta is formed. So there's one that was forming there on the left side. A new one is formed because the river finds a more direct route to the sea. As that lobe gets bigger, the land is built up and the river finds a shorter, uh, quicker route to the sea. And over time, multiple lobes are created. And then you can see that they erode away. They start to disappear. And so over 6,000 year period, we finally arrive at the actual uh, uh, the current appearance of the Gulf of Mexico. But what has happened um, is we have um, uh, built levees um, in order to, to prevent flooding from occurring uh, in human settlements like uh, New Orleans. And this is a brief video that, that talks about the impact of levees. And basically, the idea is that historically, the river would flood every spring and spread sediment out over the delta. And that would nourish the wetlands that were there and would build up the land because the land is naturally subsiding into the Gulf of Mexico. So the levees prevent that flooding from happening, which makes life a lot easier for if you happen to live in New Orleans. Uh, but it also is depriving the coastal wetlands of that uh, sediment that they need in, in order to be replenished each year. So this is, a, I'll play this briefly. The audio you're not really going to be able to hear, but you'll kind of quickly get an idea of what the, the uh, dynamics are. The Mississippi River's springtime floods plagued New Orleans for two centuries until levees protected the city and created stable channels for shipping. But the levees also cut off sediment-rich floodwaters that built the land on which the city sits and that kept alive coastal marshes that helped protect the city from hurricanes. So in a nutshell, what you had there was levees being built, preventing the floods from occurring, and then the land naturally subsides. And so uh, that is part of the dynamics of how the, how the um, uh, coastal wetlands are disappearing. Um, and yeah, let's see, we move ahead. Mississippi River, so the result of all this is a huge amount of land loss. And this map shows what that looks like. All of the red areas are lands that have been lost to coastal erosion between 1930 and 2016. And of course, so what we have is this levee system that follow, the levees follow the main channel of the Mississippi River on both sides of the river, preventing the sediment from flowing out into the wetlands. Um, and essentially, you could almost think of it as a straight jacket on the main channel of the river. The river, as you saw from the earlier um, uh, animation that showed the formation of all these different lobes, naturally wants to constantly be changing and finding new channels. But it's been straight jacketed by uh, the, um, the levees being put there. And then in addition to all of that, we have sea levels rising due to climate change. And so the combination of all those features uh, phenomenon has resulted in the disappearance of land, uh, basically an acre every 100 minutes on average over the last uh, 10, 20 years and increasingly as uh, impacts of climate change increase. So, um, one of the real challenges in understanding, like having spent a lot of time in the Delta, 
it's incredibly flat by appearance. And so you never, as many times I've been there, you want to try and get this global view of what's happening on a large scale around you. And it's very difficult to understand because it's so flat, you can never really see, you just, you kind of see an expanse, but it's hard to tell, um, you know, what's how some of these larger processes are happening. So here's another way we have of representing um, the, in this case, it's the ecological uh, it's an ecological map of the delta, and this is at the at the left side of this is the is the upper delta. The Gulf is at the far right of this image, and basically, this is an interactive module we've created that allows you to explore the different ecosystems that you would travel through as you go down the delta. It's highly exaggerated, so it looks like there's a lot of relief there. the The uh, pelicans on the right hand side look like they're on a, a large um, um, barrier island that's sticking way up out of the water in fact uh there's very little change in elevation as you as in in the reality of that setting so sometimes when you create these visual images these visualizations of a place like the delta that is very flat you need to exaggerate um the elevation changes in order to uh, enable people to kind of grasp you know how things change as you move through the landscape and finally, we've uh, there are uh, it being enacted a whole series of strategies that are called the multiple lines of defense because one of the one of the big threats uh, that face human communities in this region are incredible, incredibly powerful storms and hurricanes, which of course are increasing in in um, seriousness due to climate change, and so. As these coastal wetlands disappear, they have provided historically a buffer for uh, for human communities by being able to do, being able to absorb the energy of these storms. And so, this is a full interactive we created that uh, documents the multiple types of strategies that are being used to try and reinforce um, um, ways of of retaining protections to uh, human communities through. A lot of places, in a lot of cases, uh, trying to restore natural conditions, uh, diverting sediment into wetland areas and allowing them to rebuild, uh, and using different kinds of structural uh, solutions as well. So, again, a fascinating, complicated natural uh, landscape with complex natural systems overlaid uh, with some uh, extensive human impacts and um these kinds of interactive map experiences um are tools we've been using to help people uh, generate an understanding of what's happening there so that's my piece charlie it's back to you to wrap it up okay well i've got a couple of quick visualizations that i want to go through um and the first is thinking about this and saying you know as we work with maps we sometimes have to keep in mind that there are some real different kinds of maps and uh, that sometimes you can look at the map one way and you start thinking about certain things and then if you look at it a different way you get a very different perspective and so part of this is just really to say to people these tools are really powerful they can also shape the way that we think about things and so as a uh, former uh, eighth grade teacher, I like to uh, shake things up for my students a lot. And uh, they did the same for me, but the, the whole vision of getting people to think about how you're looking at something and uh, thinking about, okay, who am I concerned about? Uh, what are the places that I'm concerned about? We like to uh, have people see the world in different ways and try to think of it uh, from a holistic perspective. Now, we do this with land. We also do this with water. So here we've got a hydrologic hierarchy. Now, the idea of this is you're looking at this network of rivers, and many of you who have a, have, have a, have a connection to Minnesota may know about this little place, and I'm just going to click on this and say, okay, you know, trace this guy, and it says, okay, I'm actually flowing north. This is the Red River in northern Minnesota, and when you get to a lower part, you get to see the whole network, 
that is flowing. And as, as you've probably been seeing in the lower left corner, I've got, I've got displays of the water volume of some of these uh, tributaries. And part of the reason that I want to do this is to take a look at this for the Red River. Now I'm going to jump over and say, oh, there's another river over here. I don't want to click on that one. I want to click on this guy. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> All right, here we go. There we go. All right. Now, there you can see the Mississippi. And it's starting. You, you can take a look at the numbers over on the left-hand side. And you can see low thousands of, uh, and I think this is in sort of cubic feet per second kinds of numbers. And But as we work our way down, we can start to see, ah, there's, there's actually a larger a larger scope of the river that that we're going to get here. And now we're in the tens of thousands. And you can work your way farther down, tracking the river. And this is just a really kind of a fun thing to do and just watch the interplay. And those of us who lived or lived uh, in the northern reaches of the Mississippi, might not always be thinking about what's happening farther south, but but all the people who are living farther along the river, farther along that downstream flow, are really paying attention to, my God, all of those elements, all everything that everybody that is upstream of me, this is the network of people whom I'm concerned about. I need to be concerned about what's going on. And you can take this all the way down so that when you get down to the base, instead of a couple of thousand feet or a couple of thousand cubic feet, we're now hitting hundreds of thousands of, this is a big river. There's a lot of impact on the land. This is really going back to what John was talking about. And so we have one last little exploration to go through. And yes, I've done that. All right, yep, I'm gonna do that. All right, this is a, a, a very new uh, visualization that uh, somebody created at Esri. And he said, Charlie, give this one a try. And this is a water drop journey. And this takes uh, a little bit of work in order to go through. I'm going to actually run a video of it for you and say, it'll be easier to see uh, this video in operation than to uh, try to run it and Zoom at the same time. So this is not yet fully open to the public. This does require an ArcGIS online organization login. It does use uh, online resources. It just takes some, some, there's a lot of data that, get, that can be uh, sent to your screen. So let's just play this and see what happens as we go on a water drop journey. And uh, okay, yep, there we go, Charlie. Could close that. And now on this map, you can see that there are a bunch of, this is a dashboard. You can see, okay, here I am. I'm going to go take a look at that Red River of the North and I'm going to click on it. And what it's going to do is to say, all right, with this is the source, I'm going to trace downstream. Downstream is really downhill and downhill from that part of Minnesota is to the North. And you can see that displayed on the map over in the corner. And it tells you how far it's gonna be. And you can, you can play, you can hit the play button in the top right corner and it'll keep track on the numbers below the map of the population, the number of businesses, the number of farms that you're seeing there. And you can set it to be north and you can zoom in and out. It's a very cool thing. When you're done with this, you can go over on the right hand click the trash bin and that says, okay, take me back. I wanna see something. So now we're gonna to go to the start of the Mississippi River. Let's just zoom in. Here we are at the headwaters of the Mississippi and I click and it's gonna take a few seconds in order to say, all right, from that point, let's trace all the way down. I didn't, I didn't record the whole thing, I just, uh, Okay, give you a little bit of a sense of, yep, it takes a little bit of work for that to happen. Now, 
once you get down to the mouth, then it says, all right, here's your path. You can see it 1,300 miles, actually traveling 2,300 miles by the water drop and the twists and turns. And then you can watch it. And it's, I love this because here you're starting to see the landscape that it's going through and all the little crenulations of the, of the river as you're working through this flat land. It's just a wonderful display here. And it stops and says, wait a minute, I got to catch up to you. But you can start to see that it's keeping track of at the below the map, the number of people, the number of businesses, the number of farms. And what I really want is if and when you get to work with this, that you get to explore the variation between the upper Mississippi right up here at the tippy top and what's happening down at the mouth because, wow, it's a big difference. And with that, our video is just about done. But you can take a look at the land, you can intercept it and just say, I wanna explore these different watersheds and, and, and work your way down. I'm gonna go ahead and wait a minute, let me, let's see. This is the video, it's ready to stop. I'm ready to stop it, okay. John, I'll bet you there are some questions that uh, people may have uh, for some of this. And so. Yeah, that huh? sounds good. Thank you. Chris, you were. Yeah, you let's have, go ahead and dive into some great questions. So thank you, Charlie. Thank you, John. Nice work with sharing so much good information. So yeah, I'll feed you a few of the questions. We have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And then at the end of the evening, we'll share a few resources and opportunities for future professional development. So I'm going to just start at the top. There was a question a while back, and either one of you can answer. Um, feel free to stop screen sharing if you'd like to. Um, the question was about watersheds. So the question was, what are the three largest watersheds? Since our focus was on the Mississippi River, maybe you could do a comparison of anything you know in that regard. That's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, I, Charlie, do you know off the top of your head? The, I don't know the, off the top of my head. But Mississippi that would be is the a, third largest. That would be a fun one to just sit and play on my little <laughs> map thing and watch the little trees uh, explore. Explore. I did. I did look it up after that question was a, was asked, and it's number one is the Amazon, uh, by far, um, and number two was the Congo, and number three was the Nile. Nice. And uh, Mississippi is not far underneath the Nile. Right, and one of the um, well, one of the factors in I've always found this really interesting. You know, the Mississippi's watershed includes the Missouri, and the Missouri is a very long river that uh, you know comes into the Mississippi around St. Louis and with it, it it the headwaters of the Missouri to the Gulf of Mexico is actually a longer journey than the headwaters of the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. So you always have these choices about how exactly how you're going to slice and dice your watersheds. That's nice. a good question. Nice. Good. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of questions about the S3 mapping software in particular. So one is about the survey. Can you create surveys within the software? Is that how you created your survey? Okay. Yep. Absolutely. And, then, and the other one is about student use. Are students able to sign up for S3? Can they use school accounts to do so? Can they use it, uh, the story maps on a Chromebook? So everything that I showed with a potential exception to the on that last visualization that just takes more horsepower than a Chromebook tends to have, everything that, that I showed you could do on a Chromebook. Um, there is, uh, it, when I share out the, the story map collection, at the very end of that collection is information about if you're working with a school and you want to get access to the software, here's how you can do it. Um, we give the software to schools for instructional purposes around the world. So we want lots of people to be learning why and how to make maps, uh, to understand the, the patterns and the relationships that exist between the layers of information. Nice. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We have some um, 
A question about the, the heat mapping. So going back to the extreme heat mapping, someone in our audience noticed that there was extreme heat over the water. Is that something that you can explain <laughs> what's well, going on there? Yeah, there's, uh, so we were visualizing some data that is being uh, assembled by NOAA and the frequently what you'll end up with is when you watch uh, hurricanes coming in they're getting uh they're getting built up as they're sitting over warm water the the water is a sink and it it turns and then releases energy up into the clouds or up into the sky into the atmosphere and that fuels things so a yeah. lot of what you're looking at in the data may be uh, where it's taking data out into the uh, large areas of open ocean. It may be that it's just following along the strip of land or strip of water that is along the coast where you're dealing with, okay, the actual uh, uh, area itself, legal control of it extends out into the ocean uh, on these um, ocean fronting uh, and, and, Gulf fronting zones. So uh, depending on where you where we were looking, that's probably what it was uh, caused by. Nice. All right. Okay. Sounds like you're ready for the million dollar question then. If you could answer that that thoroughly, <laughs> there's a million dollar question in here. It says, uh, can the new sediment diversion projects totally stem land loss in southeastern Louisiana? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll take a shot at that. So okay. <laughs> repeat it one more time. Just sure. Like, Can the new sediment diversion projects totally stem land loss in southeast Louisiana? Okay. I, my understanding is that no solutions that are being enacted now are capable of restoring things to the way they were in 1930, which is when a lot of the most extreme um, land loss began to occur. So, I mean, to my understanding is it, to some extent it's, it's I don't want to say a losing battle. I think that this the as I understand it, the the strategies are to try and save, um, provide protections for existing uh, communities, so that the city of New Orleans has a fourteen billion dollar. Um, uh, surrounding flood wall system that is designed to keep out the kinds of impacts that uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, inflicted on the city. And, you know, how, so, I, you know, it's a hard barrier around the city and, and adding, you know, there are very large scale diversion projects. Um, uh, one that's being enacted right now that is, that is allowing large amounts of sediment to flow into these wetlands, but it's only in certain areas, you know, it's not, the loss has been over extensive areas and only um, the, the solutions are being enacted in more limited areas just because of cost. I mean, it's hugely expensive and, you know, uh, finding right conditions and, and political um, realities and so forth. So I, I think the short answer is, you know, the, the, the attempt is to uh, try and minimum to try, try and provide it as best protections as possible and to, to uh, prevent disruption of, you know, having to relocate. There already are a couple of Delta communities that have been relocated just because they're outside of all these protective areas and the, the waters have gotten so high that they're, they had to move, but to try and minimize that uh, for the future. Okay. Thank you, John. All right, final question. Uh, it's about the dead zone. And the question is, is there not also a dead zone beyond the mouth of the Mississippi River? Beyond the mouth. Beyond the, the mouth. Of, or the is there a dead zone beyond about, the mouth of the yeah. Mississippi? So the one I was describing actually is beyond the mouth. I mean, it's in the Gulf of Mexico itself. Um, uh, and also, you know, that's not unique to the Mississippi. I mean, that is a common... Uh, that happens in large uh, watersheds where there's a lot of, particularly where there's a lot of agricultural runoff with, uh, you know, nutrient pollution uh, in different places. So, I, you know, I, there, 
as far as I know, there's not one beyond the one that's already there, but the one that is there is in the Gulf and it is yeah. beyond the mouths of the world. Okay. All right. All right. Well, that wraps up our questions from the audience. Is there anything else that our panelists would like to say before I move on to our um, offerings over the summer and in the future? Any final I'm, words, Charlie or John? Go for it. I'm I'm going to throw into the chat the address of this uh, whole collection that we've yeah. been working with. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, there is another we'll question. leave that. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Sarah. Oh, um, there is another question about if this, uh, if you include charter schools in your distribution. Yep. Um, Home schools, yep, charter schools, magnet schools, parochial, everybody. We want them and all. And then the oh. the last thing that you just showed us, uh, you said that that was kind of not accessible yet to the public. When might that be? Uh, I don't know. They're they're working on it. Every, all kinds of things get released at our user conference, which happens in middle of July. And so I suspect that it may be uh, during the summer like that, but uh, that's why I wanted to make sure that it was at least there. And if you have a uh, an ArcGIS Online organization login, and uh, you can give it a give it a shot and see if it'll work for you. Right, and I wanted to just add that. Um, this um, story map we've been using for this presentation that has all the different parts and tools and resources, we're going to leave that up. So that'll be there and um, have fun with it and let us know what you learn. All right. Thank you. Um, quick last words uh, coming from Sarah and myself. Uh, You've probably seen a few of these invitations, um, but we'd love to remind you that this summer we offer lots of free professional development uh, institutes for teachers. So the registration is open. You can let Sarah know. You can check your email. Uh, more links will be provided in follow-up uh, messaging from Sarah. One of them will be in Duluth, Minnesota in June. One will be in New Orleans in July. And one will be up in Minneapolis and St. Paul, also in July. So please sign up, share with your friends, share with teachers if you can. And then last but not least, anything you're wondering, hopefully will come to you <laughs> as far as links that you can check out. So if you're wondering how to view future webinars. Um, Sarah will send links in our upcoming email. You can also search us online. Just go to Hamlin University's Center for Global Environmental Education. Look for our sea, oh, Waters to the Sea webinar website. It's under the Professional Development tab there. Uh, to get your 1.5 Continuing Education Units, your CEUs, Sarah will send out a form in that email as well. And if you're curious about all the Waters to the Sea modules, they will be included in that email, but you can also search again, practicing it, the Center for Global Environmental Education, our K-12 classroom resource site. We have a lot of cool stuff on there that you should definitely check out, whether you're a teacher or not. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here tonight and have a great evening.